Uh, could you make sure that we use the Q&A for questions? I'll try and monitor the chat, but no promises if I catch it or not. But um, let's start properly. So, hello, I'm Stuart m sud and I have the great pleasure of introducing G0KYA, otherwise known as Steve uh, Nichols, uh, who's an um, author of various books, such as Radio Propagation Explained and Stealth Antennas both very much recommended by myself i'm not on commission don't worry <laughs> uh, and steve's here to talk to us about antenna construction and and fed half wave antennas over to you yeah okay well good afternoon everyone um i chose in fed half wave antennas because i've been involved in playing with them um, designing them um, for, well, I think the first one I built was 2009. I found a photograph of it. So I've, I've included that in the presentation. And really this is, is a kind of a practical presentation of um, you know, my thoughts on them and whether they work or not, how well they work and some hints and tips on construction. So if we, we move forward, I mean, I'm gonna look at the history of the NFED half wave, which might surprise some people why NFED half-wave antennas? Why would you even bother? We look at simple designs for monoband HF verticals. Then we look at multiband NFED half-waves, trapped NFED half-waves, and then we'll look at the hints and tips. And so this is really based on 12 years of messing around with NFED half-waves, building them, um, seeing whether they work or not, and then trying to improve the designs. So there's a lot of um, was, you know, blood, sweat and tears in this presentation in that respect. So let's have a look at the background first of all. Well, I was amazed to find that in fact, the NFED half wave goes back to 1909. Um, Hans Begero of Berlin basically designed the ZEP antenna, which was um, half wave antenna. And then he used um, a, a different sort of open wire feeder to match the impedance. But I find that astonishing, 1909. I mean, if you think about Marconi, he didn't cross the Atlantic till 1901. So within eight years, um, somebody had come up with this idea. So it just shows you that there, there's no new ideas in radio. It's, we, we basically just um, you know, reconstitute and, and play with them. Um, and you might find also 1927, the Fuchs antenna is also described, uh, which again is basically an NFED half wave. But why an NFED half wave? What is it and what, what are we trying to do? Well, this is a diagram of a half wave dipole and we're feeding it in the middle there, which is the, the, you know, the, the, the classic way of feeding a half wave dipole. And in the center of a half wave dipole, you've got a high current point. Um, basically it's a low voltage and low impedance point, say 50 to 75 ohms in the middle. But there's nothing to stop you feeding that dipole you know closing that gap and feeding it at an end point but the, the the trouble is at the end point there you've got zero current flowing it's a high voltage high impedance point so what you've got to do if you want to feed a half wave dipole at one end um, you've got to transform that impedance from 2000 3000 ohms down to 50 ohms if you want to get it to work properly so that, that's really what we're trying to do. We need to find a way of transferring our impedance feed point from 3000 ohms. You'll, you'll see I'm being a bit vague about what the actual impedance point is. I mean, it's definitely more than 1800 ohms and probably less than 5000 ohms, but exactly what that impedance point is is gonna depend on a lot of things. It's also gonna depend upon um, proximity to uh, other uh, uh, objects, proximity to other conductors proximity to the ground. Um, so we kind of have to think about it as around about two and a half thousand ohms, that does it, and uh, then we can get to work. So as I said, if it's fed at the center, a dipole has an impedance equal to around about 50 to 75 ohms, depending upon the height above the ground. If it fed at the end, the impedance is more like 2000 to 3000 ohms. And what we have to do is convert from that high impedance point to a low impedance point so we can feed some power into the antenna. Um, but why, why would you bother? Um, well, if we have a ground mounted quarter wave vertical, you need extensive radials. 
um, classically up to maybe 120 radials to get it to, to, to work properly. Um, some multiband antennas are inefficient. Um, many people don't have enough horizontal space for decent antennas. Um, and to get an HF dipole to work well, it should be at least a half a wavelength above ground. So with an NFED half wave, we kind of do away with the need for extensive radials. I'm not saying we do away with the need for radials full stop, but we, do, we don't need 120, that's for sure. We can make them uh, more efficient, I think. Um, and so you don't need um, horizontal space with these antennas. If you've got a garden, you've got infinite amounts of vertical space, so vertical antennas can work very well. And uh, I'll show you that um, shortly. And so we don't need to be at least a quarter wavelength above ground. So first half-wave antenna experiments were back in 2008, 2009. And this is my previous house and um, you know, experiments we're, we're, we're playing here. What I've got is a 10 meter high fishing pole, a fiberglass fishing pole uh, with a little matching box at the bottom um, and a half wave uh, in fed for uh, 10 meter. Um, actually, was, was, this was the 10 meter version. It, I also made a 20 meter version that worked with this. Um, and the first one I, I produced really was a 20 meter in fed half wave. Um, and the reason they did this is because we were doing um, International Marconi Day and we wanted an antenna that we could put up um, in 10 minutes. Um, we do it from case to lifeboat on the east coast of England, and we wanted an antenna that could uh, take 100 watts. Sorry, I know it's QRP, but um, we needed an antenna that could take 100 watts, could be put up in literally 10 minutes and taken down in 10 minutes, um, and would be efficient. And the total cost would be around about £30 or so. Um, for example, this one used guidelines that were bought from Poundland for, believe it or not, a pound. Um, and th th this was a project that um, I kind of got involved with, with our club. And um, as a result of this, we made it a club project. And I'll show you the club project in a minute. And we built about 30 of these. And everyone who's ever used them has, has got on OK with them. It's got, got on very well. So the 20 meter NFED half wave antenna that we use for GB0 CMS, it's worked to Australia. Virgin Islands, Canada, USA, most of Europe. It works very, very well indeed. Um, and as I said, it, it, it doesn't take as long to put up, which was the main thing. We, we turn up here, we didn't do it last year because of COVID, but we've done it for the last uh, eight to 10 years, I think. Um, and we, we have to turn up half past eight in the morning and be on the air by nine. So hence the need for a quick install antenna. Um, and I don't know if anyone's ever played with towers and, and beams, um, but usually if we turn up half past eight with a tower and a beam, it's working by about two, <laughs> two p.m. So this is why we wanted something that would work and, and work quickly. So how does it work? How does the monoband um, NFED half wave work? Well, we need a parallel tuned circuit that has a high impedance of the frequency um, to which it's tuned. And you can see there the, the diagram of what we're actually trying to achieve. Now, um, Steve AA3B, um, came up with some designs for NFED half waves um, some time ago. I mean, it was back in 2008, 2009. And I took his design and just thought, well, what, what, how can I make this simpler? And we, I realized that you can use coax as fixed value capacitors. Now, RG58 has a capacitance of about 28 picofarads per foot. Um, so obviously, if you know you need uh, 14 picofarad capacitor, you can use six inches of coax. And this is quite capable of taking QRP power and quite capable of taking 100 watts. So this is, this is the way around it. It was a cheap and easy way to build a capacitor that you could use. So this, this was Steve AA 5TB, beg your pardon, I think I said 3TB. This was his design. Um, and so you can see there on the secondary, we've got um, a secondary coil and a capacitor across it which gives us the tuned circuit, and then the primary just to connect it to the coax. And do you really need a counterpoise or earth? This has is, this is, this is been debated on and off for, for years. Well, yes, you do, and no, you don't. Yes, you do need some form of counterpoise for this antenna to work. 
but the currents in that um, radial system or counterpoise are quite minimal. And what I found was that if the coax is laying on the ground and it's sufficient length, uh, maybe 10 meters or so, then really the uh, coax ca capacitively couples to the ground, so you don't really need a radial. Now, if you find that offensive and if you think, well, no, that doesn't really work, well, put some quarter wave radials on it. It probably won't make much difference, but um, you can certainly put radials on the bottom of an end fed half wave um, if it makes you feel happier. I mean, I know for a fact that um, I know some people built these and one guy was saying he had terrible RFI from it. And when we, we questioned him about it, it turned out that he'd built the thing and it was connected by a three foot piece of coax and was mounted uh, just outside his window next to the shack. Well, and it was well off the ground. So yeah, there wasn't enough there um, coax to actually work as a, as, a, as a counterpoise, if you like. And yes, he would get RFI. And it was more a case of direct injection of the, of the RF from the antenna into his rig. But so by putting the, the antenna away from the shack um, and running the coax along the ground, we, we cured all those problems completely. Um, so do you need a um, counterpoise or radials on an end-fed half wave? Well, no, not really, because there's very little current there. But if you do, then maybe radials of at least 0.05 uh, lambda, uh, 0.05 um, wavelength long, maybe four attached to the bottom of the thing, will improve things, or you can earth it or you can um, put quarter wave radials on if it helps. But what I'm saying is you do not need 120 quarter wave radials like you do on a quarter wave ground plane. Um, you know, the, the, you, you're taking the ground currents to a minimal uh, a minimum using this antenna design. So it's not crucial. Um, how do you make one then? Well, you need a half, length, half wavelength of wire using the formula there and for a 20 meter antenna that comes out at precisely 10.05 meters. Um, so if you're building a 20 meter one, you need a piece of wire 10.05 meters long. Um, now you need some sort of toroid to make your transformer. Now I originally said that T202 or the red toroids was one of the best ones, but I found out later, um, it's only after you build these things that you find these things out. But probably optimum for that kind of frequency is would be a T206, a yellow toroid, um, which would give you a low loss in the three meg to 40 meg range. But to be honest, the T200 stroke two, the red um, uh, uh, toroids, the iron powder toroids are fine for uh, 14 megs. That's what I, I started with, and it's they're, they're absolutely fine. There, there's very little in it. You could probably measure the losses, you know, within a fraction of a dB. So if you haven't got um, any yellow toroids, but if you have got some red ones, then sure, go ahead and build one. Um, one quick point here to make: there is a lot of confusion about what toroids you need for n-fed half-wave antennas, and basically what I'm talking about here is a monoband n-fed half-wave for which you can use um, iron powder toroids, uh, not a problem at all. Iron powder toroids are good for tuned circuits, and this is basically a tuned circuit. So you can use iron powder toroids, T200s um, are good enough for 100 watts, definitely, um, uh, to actually build what you need. So here we go, that, that's, they're the two toroid types, types that um, I recommend for monoband. Uh, N-fed half waves. Notice I say monoband. When we talk about multiband, it's a different story. Um, but so you build one of these 13 turns of enamel copper wire on the toroid as a secondary, two turns on the primary, and connect your um, capacitor. And in this case, it would be a, a, a piece of coax as a capacitor across it. And then basically you tune the uh, the, the thing to work by clipping. The, uh, the capacitor, if you like, ch chopping off the coax to bring it into resonance. So when you set this whole thing up with your N-fed half wave uh, wire on it, connect your uh, capacitor, check the SWR, see where it is, and then chop the uh, capacitor down until you get a one-to-one -one SWR. So here's the first one I ever built in 2009. 
And I was pretty astonished by this, that I worked out what value capacitor I needed. You can see it's about three inches there. Um, and put it all together, put it up, and I got a 1.2 to 1 um, SWR straight away. I was quite astounded by that. And uh, it just goes to show you that how you can get away with capacitors made out of coax, and it saves a, a lot of money and time. Um, and um, it, it, uh, it works perfectly well, as you can see. So we've now built these for 20 meters, 10 meters, and everything in between, uh, 17 meters. Um, I've got a load of boxes like these um, in the garage, which are the matching boxes, which have got the T200 toroids in, and they're, they're all pre-tuned. So all you need to do is connect the length of wire to them. Um, and I, I write on the box uh, what bands these are for. So this is a 10 meter one. So you connect five meters of insulated wire to it and it will give you a, a under one and a half to one SWR um, across the band. So there we go. So yes, I've got, I've got about eight of these in a box in the garage um, for, the, for monoband um, NFET half waves. But as I said, we're talking about monoband um, NFET half waves. Um, not multi-band ones that we're going to come on to. But this is a very, very simple antenna to build. And if you've got um, fiberglass poles, then they're excellent because obviously a 10 meter one is only going to be about five meters long. Even a 20 meter one is 10.05 meters long. And I think what you'll find is if you build a 20 meter version of this, a 20 meter end fed half wave, it will outperform a compromise antenna by about one or two S points. And we built these, um, as I said, for GB0 CMS and compared it with G5 RVs, whatever, and not, not spots off them. So they're very, very good indeed. Um, obviously, we, when we build these for um, GB0 CMS, which is Caster at the coast, it's put up on a sand dune fairly close to the sea. So we, we're getting some gain from that. But we've been very, very pleased with it. And uh, as I said, it will easily take 100 watts and you can make um, a smaller version with smaller um, toroids. There's a uh, FT, what's that? Uh, doo -doo -doo. I'm trying to remember what it is. That's an FT140, I think, isn't it? Um, and that, that's the QRP version, but they're not, not too hard to build at all. And as you can see on there, we've got an SWR 1.2 to 1. So that, that was straight out of the box before I'd even uh, tried to you know, start to tweak it. So this is a list of the bands that we've made them for. Um, and it tells you the length of the coax. I think this presentation will be made available. Um, if not, it, there is a version of this on my uh, uh, QRP, sorry, uh, g0kya.logspot.co.uk um, uh, website. And uh, I think if you search for EFHW and Fed Halfwave, then you'll find one of the documents that explain how these are all built. But this tells you the coax length to start with, um, so you don't have to waste lots of knots and basically just cut it down to get the, the frequency that you want. And there's the inside of uh, one of these magic boxes that we've built. And as I said, we built about 30 of these in the club about 10 years ago now, and people are still using them. Um, and they, they work very well. They're very good for portable operation. If you know you're gonna be on a particular band, say you wanna go on 20 meters, just connect one of these up to an end fed half wave, you know, uh, length of wire up a, a pole and away you go. In fact, we're, we're doing this tomorrow. The radio club has a, uh, an annual radio by the seaside and we go to North Norfolk and uh, I've been using one of these every time we've, we've been along and it, it, it works quite well. And they're very cheap. As I said, 30 pounds gets you uh, the whole antenna built and it, this will offer a low SWR across the whole band uh, on 20 meters anyway. So that's, uh, that's, that's good. Um, so how do we make a multiband version? Now, this is the, the, the problem in that, um, that, that kind of stymied me for a little while. How do you make a multiband version? We have kind of worked out you make a, a monoband version, but how do you make a multiband version? Well, it starts off really with a simple fact that a 66 foot length of wire gives you um, half waved, in a half wave at 40 meters, two half waves at 20, three half waves at 15, et cetera, et cetera. So you can build a, a 40 to 10 meter antenna with 66 foot length of wire. If you've got a bit more space, 132 foot length of wire 
gives you 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10. So that, that's a pretty good expansion um, or, or a, an expansion of, of what you can do with instead of, instead of one antenna. Um, but the problem is that you need a matching box that actually transforms that um, uh, um, impedance down on all of those frequencies. And then this is where um, Dutch radio hams come into the story. Danny Horvitz um, of My Antenna, uh, Steve Ellington, N4LQ, has done a lot of videos on this, and they're all worth, they're very good and worth watching. And we're looking at 49 to 1 and 64 to 1 antennas. So this is where the, the trick came into it, is instead of building a matching box that um, resonates on one frequency, build a, a, um, a toroidal transformer that will transform every uh, frequency that you want to operate on through 49 to 1 or 64 to 1. Uh, transformer. So example this, if you've got a 2450 ohm impedance, divide that by 49 to 1, gives you 50 ohms. So that's that's why we use a, a 49 to 1 transformer. Now the, the, the clever thing is, well, okay, so what toroid do you use and how do you actually get this to work? And uh, luckily, um, you know, this is where um, you know, the work that uh, the, the, the Dutch boys did Danny uh, with it, my antennas and, and Steve Ellington has done extensive work. You know, we now we now have the answer. Um, if it, also I've said that if you're lucky, the 132 foot version may also offer you low SWRs on 60, 30, and 12 meters. And uh, my antennas, um, uh, 80, 10 version, I've got one here that does give me a low SWR on just about every band. So I can use it from everything from 80 meters to 10 meters and pretty much know I'm going to get an, an SWR below three to one. So what do what do the transformers look like um, for one of these for multiband version? Well, I think this is basically what um, we people have come up with. So we've got um, a toroid there, um, FT43 type. Um, so FT24043 um, or FT14043. If you want to use QRP only, um, the FT140 is fine. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but the figure, the 240, basically means it's 2.4 inches in diameter. The FT140 means it's 1.4 inches in diameter. That's um, the way to actually read these things. Um, and the 43 is the mix. It's the, the makes up the makeup of the uh, toroid. And these are ferrite toroids, hence the FT. So it's ferrite toroid 240-43, where before we were using uh, iron powder uh, toroids, um, which were just T200 or whatever. But for the multiband one, you need ferrite. And these are the numbers to look for. So ideally you need maybe, um, for 100 watts, you need a 240-43 um, or FT-140-43 for QRP. What I would do is I would build yourself um, an FT-240-43. They're not that big. This is, um, let's get that right. This is an FT-240-43 in a box. Okay, it will take 100 watts. Um, it will also operate, operate on QRP. But the thing about it is that you've got enough inductance in the bigger toroid to make it work better on 80 meters. I worked with the uh, 140, 43, this tiny little thing. And yes, it would tune on 80 meters, but the performance wasn't brilliant. So there's no harm in going a bit bigger um, and actually making yourself um, a transformer, 49 to 1 transformer that will actually give you good results on 80 meters as well. So even though we're talking about QRP, I recommend going a little bit bigger um, and making something that uh, will, will work on 80 meters and give you better performance. So um, you can build one of these, as I said, you basically twist the wire, go around two turns and then another five turns, then you go across and then you put another seven turns on so that gives you 14 to 2 or 7 to 1. Now, the uh, way of working out the impedance transformation on a toroid is you, it's the square of the turns ratio. So we have a primary with two turns and a secondary of 14 turns. 
that's seven to one. Therefore, the impedance transformation is seven squared or 49 to one. Um, so there we go. You'll also notice there's a hundred picofarad high voltage capacitor across the primary as well. That just helps to um, help with the matching on the upper bands. And uh, they're very, very cheap. On eBay, you can buy these um, for you know pence really. So I usually order about 10 or so of these and it will easily take 100 watts, probably take 200 watts. Um, it won't take 400 watts, but we're QRP today, so we don't need to worry about that. The reason I can say this is because, um, there's no secret, but I did a load of testing for um, some antennas for the RSGB, and we were looking to see which of the commercial NFED halfway transformers were capable of taking 400 watts and basically came to the conclusion that if you've got a single toroid, it's not gonna take 400 watts. It might take 100 watts, well, take 100 watts, no problem. 200 watts, maybe, but it will get hotter. But anything more than that, it, you're gonna get problems and you find the SWR varies as the temperature goes up. Um, but QRP, we don't have that worry. But just to, just to uh, confirm again, so for QRP use, I recommend the um, 240-43, Yes, you can, you can make it work with a smaller one, a 140, 43, but the 240 gives you that much more inductance, which means it will work better on 80 meters. So it's a nice, nice box to make um, because this little thing here will work all bands from 80 through to 10 meters, depending on what you put on the end of it. So it's a, it's a nice overall um, uh, good sort of, not compromise, but a good, um, Piece of equipment to have for all sorts of use. Um, so we're talking about multi-band antennas. So as I said, if you put a 66 foot wire on, you get 40, 20, 50 an antenna of it. Um, if you put 132 foot wire on it, you can get 80, 40, uh, 20, 15 and 10. Um, but I also thought, well, could you make a multi-band version with traps? And so I played around with making them and um, came up with a 20, 15 and 10 meter version using coaxial traps and an FT240 transformer. And it will fit on a seven meter fishing pole. Um, and I used it in the 2021 Commonwealth contest and in fact came second place in the assisted category for QRP. Now, to be fair, um, most of the contacts I think were probably on 40 meters or 80 meters, some were on 20. But it worked, it worked quite well on 20 meters. So I think once we get a few more sunspots, we'll be talking about propagation in the, the, the uh, other chat room later, I guess, um, you know, it, it will become a worthwhile antenna. But at the moment, probably less so because we're not getting much propagation on 15 and, and 10 meters. And now the, the sporadic east season in the Northern Hemisphere has now ended, we're getting even less propagation on 15 and 10 meters. But so this was a, a, a multi-band version I made, um, just uses this uh, box of tricks, as I said, just one single box of tricks to connect it at the bottom. Um, but I'll show you what it looks like. For starters, I, these are the coaxial traps um, that I made and I used a online coaxial trap calculator to work out how many turns you need to make these coaxial traps. And you need two traps for a three band uh, vertical. You need a 10 meter trap and a 15 meter trap um, if you want to make a 20, 15 and 10 meter um, uh, trap, uh, uh, multi-band and fed half wave. And I put some measurements on there um, so that you can actually see what sort of lengths you need to actually make them if you build them with coaxial traps. And I modeled this in Amarnagel and uh, got it perfect how I wanted it um, and built it. It was a disaster. And I put it away for six months while I tried to work out why it's a disaster. Um, because it was winter as well. And there's nothing like building antennas in the winter is the, you know, getting rain down the back of your neck. But anyway, the, the reason it didn't work terribly well was because I'd estimated the um, capacitance of these traps and got, got it wrong. So all these, the lengths that I've calculated in the Marnagel were all wrong. So I went back to first principles again and started again. I first cut a uh, half wave for 
10 meters and put that onto the trap and tuned that until I got the SWRs I wanted, then started to put the um, increase the length and put the 50 meter trap on and then finally put the, the, the last bit of wire on to make it up to 20 meters and got um, SWRs below two to one on all three bands. So this now I, I can just um, put on a fishing pole and uh, get it to work uh, you know, straight away. I'll just go back so that that's the, the picture of it on the right hand side there. And you can see I just thread the, um, the traps through the uh, fishing pole and just tie them on with a little bit of PVC tape just to hold it in place. But it, it's a good antenna for, um, for, for contesting because you've got three bands. Is the performance up as, as good as a monoband one? No, it isn't. And you can see why if you actually add those lengths up. I mean, technically, a 20 meter end fed half wave should be 10 meters long. But if you actually work that, work that out, I think you come in at somewhere about seven meters. Now, the reason that it's shorter is because the inductance of the traps. Um, so, yes, we're now getting inductance to make the thing shorter, uh, which we didn't really want in the first place. So that, hence the efficiency goes down. So be aware that if you build a multi-band um, trapped end fed half wave, the performance won't be as good as the monoband one because you have to make it a lot shorter to get it to work. There is another reason why I think the 20 meter, um, so it doesn't work so well on 20 meters. And that's because the current maximum um, on 20 meters is right in the middle of that 10 meter trap. So again, you're, you're cutting your performance down. If you wanted a simple, easy to build three band antenna, no tune antenna, this will work, but it won't work as well as a monoband one. And I think that that's one thing I learned from it. So again, if you're, if you're talking about QRP, you want every bit of power you can get. So a monoband one works an awful lot better than a trapped one. These are the traps, so you can see what they look like. Um, and I used V6YP's calculator uh, by putting the frequency, um, the form diameter, what's the diameter of your coax, and it will tell you how many turns you need to get the, uh, the trap to resonate to where you want it to be. It's probably worthwhile checking them either with um, a grid dip oscillator or um, another MFJ meter where I've got a, my MFJ meter, I've got a little attachment I can put on the top to, to check for the dips. Um, but they're, they're very simple to make, very cheap. And then once you've got them to where you want them to be, just wrap them in tape to stop the, the, the coax uh, un unraveling and changing the resonant point. But um, you know, this, this antenna, you can put it up in, in minutes, literally, I can put it in the back garden. Um, I don't have to worry about radials because we're using the coax as, as basically um, the, the, the counterpoise, if you like. But that's very, very simple. And I just mark on there the traps, um, what frequency they are, and I've got a, a range of traps to, to play with. Um, but so the only thing is with this is best thing to do is if you're going to build one is take your time with it and put the first piece of wire on and the first trap and then resonate it where you want it to be, cutting the length, you know, then add the next bit and play with that, get that right, then add the final piece um, to get it right. Because if you use something like a Marnagal to work this out without knowing the um, exact capacitance of the uh, traps, you'll, you'll end up all over the place. And I, I did, I ended up with an antenna that was meant to be a tri-band antenna, but actually ended up, um, it was at a low SWR, about 10 megs, nowhere else. And I thought, oh, I just threw it in the, in the, uh, the garage and left it for six months, so I was so fed up with it. But just so you know, if you're talking about vertical end fed half waves, this is pretty much what the radiation pattern looks like. Um, so it's omnidirectional, which is a bonus, I guess. Um, and you can see it's a pretty low angle radiator. It's absolutely useless for envis or uh, around the, uh, you know, your locality uh, propagation, but it's pretty good for low angle radiation. So in other words, if you're gonna build a, a vertical end fed half wave, don't build one um, for 40 or 80 meters because it won't work terribly well. And it'd be pretty long anyway, um, but for 10, 15, 20 meters, that kind of frequency, um, and you want to work some DX, it's, it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good um, low angle radi radiator and it's omnidirectional as well. Or as a friend of mine says, they will radiate equally poorly in all directions. Which, uh, I'll have to thank him for that one. 
So hints and tips. Um, you can convert a 66 foot end fed halfway to work on 80 meters by adding a coil and then further two meters of wire. Um, the books or the, uh, the web source that I saw suggested adding 110, um, what it be, microfarad coil to it. Um, again, you can use uh, an online coil um, calculator to work out how many turns you need to do that. And so I've, I've got a coil and I built it. And yes, it does, you do get a low SWR on 80 meters with a 66 foot end fed half wave. Does it work terribly well? No, not really. Um, it's a compromise again. So um, I, I wouldn't really recommend it, but if you've got no space at all, it will give you a low SWR um, on 80 meters and you can tune that to whatever part of the band you want. So if you want CWN, you can, you can build it. It will get you on the band. And we've, we've got a number of our members who haven't got particularly large gardens. Uh, I keep saying our members, that's the Norfolk Amateur Radio Club, by the way, um, who didn't have very long gardens. So we, I designed this really so that they could get on the air on 80 meters and it, and it works, but it's not terribly efficient, to be honest. Um, another trick that we can learn from uh, myantennas.com from Danny Horvitz is that if you add a six turn coil about 78 inches up from the feed point on the 132 foot version, that will bring the low SWR down um, from uh, 29 megs to 28.5. It just adds some inductance and just drags the uh, SWR point down. The problem is if you, if you think about it, if you have an end fed halfway port 80 meters, so say you design it for 3.5 megs, well say 3.6 megs. So it, it's got low SWR at 3.6, it's got low SWR at 7.2, 14.4 28.8 and so it's slowly getting higher and higher and we don't really want that so a way of getting it bring the swr down is to add this compensation coil um, to the antenna it will have minimal effect on 80 meters but it'll have a quite a big effect on the higher bands so this is a trick from myantennas.com to actually bring the swr down um, so it offers you a low swr where you want it rather than where it ends up and as I said, um, for QRP use, let's repeat this again, an FT140 uh, toroid is fine, but an FT240 gives you more inductance and better performance on 80 meters. So I think for the sake of something a little bit bigger, uh, that's the, the box I use for Q, QRP use and, and uh, 100 watt use as well. You may as well go ahead and make it with an FT240, 43, and that will give you um, better performance on 80 meters. Into tips number two, you can make a multi-band end fed halfway by using a, a camping washing line spool. Now, these aren't really available in the UK, I don't think, but you can get them off eBay. I think it's a company called Coglin. I ordered um, three or four. And I think they thought, what on earth is this guy in Britain doing ordering camping line washing line spools? But uh, this is why. So these little spools are very useful. They easily come apart. And you can um, put on a half wave of wire on there, uh, say for 40 meters. And then what I did is I marked with a Sharpie pen half waves along that line for 10, 12, 15, 17, 20, 30, and 40. So basically any band I want to go on, it's easy. You just spool it out to the, um, to the mark that you want, just tie it off, put it up, and there it works. And I know this works because we um, had, um, an, well, not an emergency, but we wanted to work some 30 meter stuff um, at one of our international Marconi day stations. And uh, someone was saying, well, we haven't got a 30 meter antenna. So I've got this in the boot, we'll try it. So we spooled it out to half wave uh, 30 meters, put it up using the same um, 49 to one uh, matching transformer and it worked perfectly. And it, uh, so I think that's a really cheap and easy way of getting a multi-band antenna. Um, um, in, you know, that you can work on whatever band you want then. So you can spool out whatever length you need and connect it to the matching box and away you go. If you're not that bothered, you can spool out the whole 40 meters and that will give you 40, 20, 15 and 10, obviously. But if you want to work the other uh, work bands, the 12 meter, 17 meter, you have to spool it out to the length that you require. So hints and tips number three, um, use stainless steel hardware, uh, on all your boxes because they get wet, obviously. Um, 
and uh, you don't want things going rusty. And so I've, I, I bought some stainless steel nuts and bolts, which I've been using for years, actually. I can't even remember where I bought them from. They were off eBay. So everything on here is stainless steel and it makes a, makes a big difference. The other thing is avoid house um, type mastic. By mastic, I mean the stuff that comes in the big tubes that you squeeze. Um, because I use, as you can see that, a mastic to, to hold the um, toroid into place in the box. But if you use the stuff that smells of vinegar, that's acetic acid, you'll find it, it can corrode stuff quite badly. Um, so I don't recommend you, if, it's, if you're using mastic, if it smells of vinegar, I wouldn't use it. I would, I would get some um, other commercial stuff that doesn't smell of vinegar and hasn't got acetic acid in it, and that will stop stuff um, actually corroding away. I uh, use nylon locking nuts and bolts, uh, not screws, wherever possible. Uh, I'll tell you why, because this is the earth connection on this one, and it's very hard to actually get them to lock. So it's a good idea to uh, use nylon nuts and bolts and um, also like the, the star washers just to make sure that things don't start turning when you don't want them to. Um, you'll also see on, online and somewhere that you might need to wrap the toroids with PTFE tape. I think that's been knocked out of the window now. You don't need to do that. You can go straight in and just uh, wrap the uh, toroid with the, the um, enameled wire. Basically, it's the, 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 the ferrite toroids uh, are not good conductors at all, so it's unlikely to arc over. And if you put PTFE tape on your toroid, you are just holding the wires away from the toroid, so you're not doing yourself any favours at all. And I think it was Steve Ellington who, who worked that one out, that you don't need to put PTFE tape on the, the toroid. And finally, um, one other point is a good source of plastic boxes in the UK, at least, is Screwfix. They do an IP55 weatherproof outdoor enclosure. I haven't got one here at the moment, but um, which gives you a box about that kind of size. And they're about £3.79, so they're very cheap. The reason I like them is they have a very, very good um, gasket on them that's not likely to, to fall off. And they're, they're a very well-made box. I think they're so cheap um, as well. So there we go. So I think that's really it. There's some links for more information. So as I said, my Blogspot uh, website has got construction details for monoband and multiband NFED half waves. Steve, uh, AA5TV's blog has got other information on there as well. Steve Ellington's videos are, are a must see if you are thinking about building any of these at all, because he has really gone into a lot of detail on how to build them and also tested things like questions you might have, like, well, does an in-fed half-wave antenna work as well as a center-fed half-wave antenna? And the answer is, well, yes, it does, actually. Um, if it's fed properly, it does. And then really two commercial companies there, finally, are... Uh, high end fed high end company dot nl um, that's the, the netherlands uh, um, company that produces uh, 49 to 1 uh, transformers and also myantennas.com this is um, the uh, american company um, that is uh, danny horvitz has, has got now i recommend them i recommend my antennas because I've, I've used one or, or a number of us have used them for a number of years. And I, put, I bought one in the end because we, we moved to this new location about a year ago. And I, had, I, had, I was going to build my own. And I just thought, oh, do you know what? I've got so much going on. I'm just going to build, I'm just going to buy one and put one up. So I ordered it. It wasn't cheap, um, but it's, it's been up for a year and it works really, really well. It offers low SWR way across the band from 3.5 to, to, to 10 megs, sorry, 10 meters. And uh, I think they're very well made and I think they're, they're, they're worth having. Um, so there we go. So that's really where we are on NFED half-wave antennas. So if I probably now stop this, we can get on to questions, um, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. So question number one comes from Mike G0JXX. He says, hi, Steve. I built one of these based on the instructions and tweaked it. Um, right. Hold on. It's all right. Window disappeared. The only problem I had was that it took some tweaking to get it resonant on 20 meters. It wanted to resonate much lower. Any thoughts as to why that might be? And he's added a no. I doubled up on the T200-2 to give it a potential for QRO. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, why would it be to, I, I think probably guessing that you worked out the, the length of the antenna using the, the classic sort of 468 um, um, in feet uh, calculation, but PVC coated an, uh, antenna wire um, generally ends up too long. It needs to be shorter um, because of the, um, what's it called? The, um, I mean, what's it called now? I've lost the thread. Um, but yeah, basically, if you calculate what you think to be an end fed halfway for, say, 20 meters, and you make it out of, of PVC coated wire, um, you'll find it's too long. And that might be what it is. Um, if, if you cut it a bit shorter, you'll probably find that the SWR will come down. It's a, it's a classic thing. I think even with people who use Imanagal or other um, programs to calculate antenna lengths if you then make it out of shortening factor that's it i can see somebody just said yes yeah, a shortening factor is to do with the speed of light um in a pvc coded inductor and um so you you end up everything needs to be about sort of five percent shorter so that might be what it is um probably is actually but yeah the, you, the, the, I think the thing, velocity factor, there we go, look, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Michael. Just lost that uh, for a second there. But yeah, does that make sense? I don't know. <laughs> we'll go to the next one. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, apologies if I've mispronounced this. Uh, Klaus Eric uh, Wiemann um, asks, with a 49 to one transformer, could you use a Z match ATU? to make it multi-band, I assume? Um, yeah, the trouble is with the Z-Match ATUs is they generally don't like um, end-fed half waves. I don't think you, you get the range that you um, expect uh, from a Z-Match. In other words, you may find that they work okay up to maybe 300 ohm impedance, and not the 2,500 ohm impedance that we find. And if you, even if you did, you'll find that the, the tuning would be very, very um, twitchy, very hard to actually tune um, a, an end-fed half wave with um, you know, a conventional tuner. Um, so this is why we generally build the 49 to one and sometimes 64 to one. See, a 64 to one transformer, by the way, is just instead of having 14 to, to turns and two turns to give the seven to one uh, ratio, you make it so that you've got um, an eight to one ratio um, to give 64 to one. I mean, generally, I think people have decided that 49 to one is, is enough, but you can build a 64 to one um, with, um, transform if you like. You'll notice I'm not using the word unun. Um, you often, people refer to these as ununs, um, unbalanced to unbalanced transformers. Technically, yeah, okay. I suppose you could argue it's a it's an unun, but it's it's a transformer, basically a 49 to 1 transformer. I think that's that's the, the better way of looking at it. So I don't tend to use the word unun. Um, but I guess is it is it an unun? Well it is, I suppose. But uh 41 49 to 1 transformer is probably a better way of looking at it. Okay, thank you. Uh Trevor G6 P S Z asks, how would the trapped aerial compare to a 10 meter long um, brackets 20 meter using a multi-band matching transformer expected to work 20 meter and 10 meter? Okay. Um, I think what you have to do with that one is you have to think about what you're actually trying to do. Um, if you put up a, a, a 20 meter length of wire, sorry, a 10 meter length of wire, which is a 20 meter end fed half wave, and then you look at it on uh, a, a, an antenna program like in Marnagal, you'll see that the radiation pattern changes quite dramatically. Um, so you've now got two half waves there on 10 meters and the low angle radiation tends to break up and you get more high angle radiation. Now we, we tested this, um, built a 10 meter antenna, sorry, a 20 meter end fed half wave and then we tested it on um, some local 10 meter stuff and found that there was down about an S point or two on local contacts. And basically that's because you've lost that low angle radiation that you were getting um, with an end fed half wave on 10. 
So now we've got a full wave antenna on 10 and the radiation pattern changes dramatically. Um, so how do I think it would compare? Probably not a lot in it because with the uh, trapped one, you've got the losses in the traps. Um, um, but fair against that, you're, you're not using a full length wire. Now, I think it's one of those things that you can experiment with. I mean, if you build yourself um, a 20 meter antenna, 20 meter end fed half wave antenna, you can try it on 10 meters and see how it goes. But generally it works better at high angles than lower angles. So I think you, you're kind of sacrificing some of the low angle performance, um, but it is, um, a, it's a compromise. Um, but it is, that's where the compromise goes, I think. And I was quite surprised actually that, that, that on low angle performance, it was down about two S points. Um, but I think that's what, that's the reason why if you model it, you know, it goes high angle and you lose the, the um, low angle. Generally, I found that the monoband and fed half waves work better than multiband ones. And I think that's really why, um, I mean, the, my antenna is 80 to 10 meter one. I mean, yeah, it works very well on 80 meters and 40 meters, but on 10 meters, not a fantastic performer because you've got lobes all over the place. And if your lobe actually happens to land on the place you're trying to work, great. But if it's on a null, then it's not so good. So on the whole, I think dedicated monoband antennas work better than multiband antennas, but it's horses for courses and it's what you can fit in. Okay. Uh, Tristan G0KAY wants to know more about the uh, washing line. Yeah. Uh, the particular question is, what happens to the unused wire in the reel from a radio point of view? Right. Well, you might think that it would actually work as um, some sort of loading coil, but it's actually at the end of the antenna. So uh, when runners are end fed half wave, there's not much current there, really. It's a high voltage point. So not an awful lot. It doesn't actually have much effect on it. Um, and you can you can reel it in and out to, to just just get to the point you want. So I think it works quite well. But it's a little bit like having um, actually if you if you do any modeling and you put a loading coil at the end of an antenna, yes, it brings the frequency down dramatically. But only if you've got a little bit of wire after that. If you've got the loading coil just right at the very very end and, and then nothing, um, you, you probably doesn't you don't find it has any effect at all. So I, I found that it, as long as it was, it was coiled up inside the box of tricks, it was, it was fine. But um, yeah, so if you search on ebay.com, uh, not eBay UK, for these Coglan, C-O-G-H-L-A-N, I think they are, uh, washing line antennas. I don't think I've ever found them in the UK, um, but they worked out about five pounds a piece and uh, they're, they're, they're worth getting hold of. And uh, so I've got a couple um, and just, just 40 meters of what or 20 meters of wire actually um, it will work on any band you want uh, 20 through to 10 just by spooling it out oh millets used to have them somebody's saying there i don't do we have millets anymore i think uh, millets do they go bust i don't think we've got a millets uh, around now but uh, uh, there we go i think they're part of sports direct's empire of every company going all right okay well there we go millets try millets definitely so Michael SM7UDB is asking, does the wire size matter in the toroid? And does um, it matter whether it has insulation or not? Right, okay. Um, generally we use, um, I, I wouldn't call it insulated, but we, we use the, um, what do we call it? You know, the um, enamel copper, that's the word I'm looking for. We use the enamel copper just so it, it stops arcing across from, from turn to turn. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the thicker the wire, the better, but you then get to that point where you can't actually twist it around the toroid. So um, I've avoided using the um, SWG figures for these because it, it will depend upon what toroid you're putting it on as to whether you can actually wrap it. In fact, this one, uh, if you can see how broad that, that is, that is actually quite tough to actually um, coil around. And in fact, I, I ended up buying some separate stuff. I can't remember what, what SWG this is. I mean, it might be 14, but it was just too tough to actually twist around the toroid. So yes, it does. I mean, the, the thinner the, 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 um, the copper wire, the higher your uh, losses will probably be, although it's not going to be fantastic. Um, and if you're running QRP, it won't make much difference. 
but it's a, it's more a practical case of how easy is it to actually twist it around the uh, the uh, toroid to be honest so i think steve uh, um ellington has as i think he recommends is it ah mind you we've got to watch this because the american wire gauge is different to ours isn't it yeah um so yeah i think i worked out about 14 swg but quite well it is in america i don't know but it's a case if you've got some to, different ones to play with I, the first one i thought was way too thick i couldn't i couldn't actually twist it around the toroid no it was a mess so i gave that one up and uh, went to a, a smaller size but certainly not too thin because you get losses because of um resistance but not too big because you won't wrap it around the toroid and yeah enamel coated preferably just to stop it uh, arcing between turns. But again, we're talking about P QRP here, so you can get away with uh, you know, murder. One of the many advantages of playing with it. Mm. Um, so Bill AB1AV is asking, on the transformer, does it make a difference if you use an auto transformer tra uh, tapped at two turns instead of the twisted two turns? I don't think so. Um, I think it's it's just a case of if it's working as a as a forty nine to one transformer, it doesn't matter whether you've done it as an auto transformer or, um, or or any other type of transformer. I don't. I think the losses will be, will, will be quite minimal. I think the the method of twisting was kind of pioneered by uh, Steve Ellington, um, and everyone's kind of followed that. But um, I think on the monoband ones, I just put two turns over the top of this. Um, and that seemed to work quite well. Um, so yeah, you could try it and see. Um, that it, there we go. There's someone said 14 SW is about 2.1 uh, millimeter uh, diameter. Yeah, um, I think I can just about twist that around one of these, but I wouldn't want to go much bigger. Um, I don't know is the easy answer. Um, I think it's a it's a room for experimentation. There's an awful lot of room for experimentation in this. Um, and also, oh, that's the other thing really is that if you build something. Uh, an antenna it's worth doing some testing with whisper just to see how well it gets out it's all right saying um you know this antenna works okay but what does that really mean and so i've done extensive tests with um nfed half waves uh, multiband nfed half waves um comparing them with other antennas to see whether they actually work or not and you know that's how you find out that and you know a multiband one doesn't work quite as well as the uh, the monoband one but it's it's uh, it's well it's quite a depressing <laughs> depressing thing to find out actually. But that's what I found. That's what the the, the monoband ones work well. Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, we have ran out of time. All right. So thank you very much for no uh, giving that really interesting talk. There are lots of questions. Unfortunately, we've not been able to do. But um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for, for, for attending. Okay.